a stabbing sword. And they would move in with that shield up like this, and they would stab. They would go forward like this. They would stab forward at the enemy. And they'd march over the fallen bodies. And if a Roman soldier became wounded, the cavalry behind him, they would grab him, pull him back, and the guy would step in to keep the wall intact. So they fought as a unit. And that's how they waged combat. And, and they were effective when they waged combat in that way. And Paul likens the army in formation to the believer in the body of Christ. That we learn to grow and to stand together as one unit. And, and then he talked about how we do this. But he says, because with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Be alert all the time. But perseverance, going through the situation, but trusting God and finding encouragement one from another as believers in Christ. That's called the body of Christ, the church. You know what happened? The Roman soldiers were victorious when they fought in unit, but they did not fight good in isolation. As a matter of fact, the greatest defeat of the Roman army that happened in the entire history of the Roman army took place in Germany in a place called the Tannenberg Forest. And there was a narrow trail they were marching through going to attack the enemy. And the enemy had hidden out in the trees. And what happened was that they came down and attacked them and they caught them before they could get into formation and they completely wiped out the entire Roman army because they were fighting in isolation, not as a unit. And as a matter of fact, it shook up the Roman Empire, kind of like 9-11 did to us. And, and so it was that they went back in there to, to uh, conquer that land again. And this time they were prepared and they conquered the enemy because they fought as a unit. They didn't allow themselves to get isolated and separated. And this is the way that it works in the Christian community is that we stand together in prayer and in unity. We did that this morning. We called the people together. We prayed and we're now we're trusting God. We know that God only is in control of everything that happens in our lives. But we find that there is a unity of believers in the common faith that gives to a strength to fight against the attacks of the enemy. And so we, we, we look at this and Paul says, put on the whole armor of God because we are in a battle. Albert Camus said these words. He's speaking of Christ. He said, Christ, the God man suffers too with patience. Evil death can no longer be entirely imputed to him since he suffers and dies. The night on Golgotha is so important in the history of man only because it is a shadow of divinity ostensibly abandoned is uh, that divinity ostensibly abandoned its traditional privilege and lived through the to the end despair included the agony of death this is explained in the lama sabak tonight and the frightful doubt of christ in ag agony it is a sense of understanding that jesus has understand what you're going through because he went through it before you Therefore, in Christianity, we find that one of the things that happens is that this is the faith that speaks of solidarity. God's solidarity with us in our situations, whether it's sickness of body, whether it's battles we're facing with, with struggles of our past or, or mistakes or sins we've made. We go through that time of feeling forsaken. The word Lama Sabachthani is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's Aramaic. And, it, and it's the statement that Jesus cried from the cross. But yet, as I mentioned last Sunday, the cry was my God. He never disowned God the Father. He cried out, I feel forsaken, my God, my God. But because of that, He stands in solidarity with us and our struggles so that we can move from where we are of being victim and defeated to victorious and triumphant. And God moves us in the right direction. And so he talks about the fact that one of the things is, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Temptation is common to all men. All, when I use the term men, I meant that's numeric for humanity. That all humanity, men and women, are tempted at some point in their life. You will struggle with it. You will find temptation. Sometimes it will come in one form, and another time it will come in another form. But because we're human, we are in this world and we face those trials. But James makes it very clear in James 1, verses 13 through 15, where he says this. Let no one say when he is tempted, the word there is tested or tried, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. He's untemptable. And, 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 and he cannot be tempted by that which is evil or loathsome. And he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away. The word there means to be drawn away from and enticed. That means to be lured by his own lust. 
And then when lust has conceived, and he's using, he's using the idea of pregnancy there. When lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. When it comes to the end, it brings forth death. James gives to us an analogy of what temptation is like. He tells us, number one, it doesn't come from God. God doesn't, is not tempted by evil, nor does He tempt us with evil. Secondly, He reminds us concerning this that we are called upon to understand where it comes from. It comes from ourselves. You know, they used to have a comedian on TV back in the 60s and 70s. Some of you don't even know what TV is because you're that generation that uh, used the iPad and the iPods and all that stuff. But uh, there, was a, there was a guy that was on TV and, and uh, he would dress up like a woman and he'd call himself Geraldine Flip Wilson and he would always play this part and he'd always say, the devil made me do it. And everybody would laugh. And they all say, well, I guess the devil does. Actually, the Bible says we are drawn away by our own point of control. That there's something that would control us if we allow it. And so we define temptation. Def temptation is the testing and trying of our desires. It is, the temp it is the testing and trying of your desire, my desire. It is latent evil of our fallen human nature. It lies there waiting to manifest itself. We are carried away by what, we, what secretly controls us. You know, if you get around somebody and you listen carefully, it won't be too long before they're telling you what really is interesting to them or what they value. It doesn't take long. I've been around people that didn't know I'm a minister because I didn't go around testifying or bragging about it. I've had fun with it afterwards. But uh, I've had them say, you know, uh, want to go get a beer? Yeah, a &W sounds good to me. And then you begin to go into the conversation. I had one time one years ago when I was a young minister, I, uh, I, I, was, I decided, I ran with my, my brother-in-law. He used to deliver from stores called Highlander in San Diego, and they were men's clothing stores. So I always like to go around and see if I can get a discount, you know, and stuff like that. And so anyway, we drove, and we go we from place to place and deliver, make deliveries. And we walked in one day, and the, and the manager of the store was saying this, and he, uh, and he said uh, something, and he, and he cussed, and he looked up at me, and I was looking down at him. And he said, the way this day is going, he said, it's probably my luck that you're a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> my brother-in-law looked over and said, yeah, so this is my brother-in-law, Reverend Robert Proctor. And the guy's face is cut red. And he looked at me, he said, that's that day. And he said, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I said, well, you know, you said it to me in my presence, but I said, let me tell you, there's one who hears everything you say when nobody's around. And I said, that's the one you've got to give an account to. I said, I'm just a man like you. But I said, there, there's a God that knows and hears every word, but he can help you. And see, that's the way that it is, that, 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 that we are caught when we don't realize we're being caught. That's what temptation does. It moves into our lives and tempts us to do things that are wrong. And, and, and it's likened to the following analogies. A fish caught by bait or a bird caught in a snare. If you find this in Ecclesiastes. It says this. Moreover, man does not know the time, his time. In other words, we don't know how much time. Like fish caught or seeds or grass are trapped in a treacherous, harmful setting, hooked on a line and a net, and birds trapped in a snare so that men are ensnared at an evil time when it suddenly falls on them. Ecclesiastes 9 and 12, it's in your bulletin, the reference. I want you to realize what temptation does. It's like a, a fish being caught. Now, the, yesterday, uh, Brad took uh, Ben and, and Robert, and we went with him. Ben wanted to fish, and he's, he, we believe he's not going to, we're just trusting God for this week, but he's, he's always wanted to fish, and, uh, and he hasn't had a chance to really go fishing. So we went out that day, and uh, they put the bait on the line. And the fish will nibble at it. And then they bite it. And that's what happens. He says that, he says that temptation is like you're nibbling. You know, we put worms on that. Or they did, I didn't. Because I didn't have a fishing license. You get a big fine if you even touch a fishing pole if you don't have a license. And, uh, and uh, we put even, uh, they put lures on there. Fish would bite at it. They come along, they swim, they see it, and, and, and they would bite at it, and they'd be hooked. 
And it's like a bird. You know, when, when they trap a bird, what they do, they mail a box. And they put a stick underneath there. And they have a, they have a strain or a twine drawn out from it. And they put leaves on top of the twine. And they put leaves on top of the box and, and, and inside. And they put grain. They run grain down there. And that bird lands and starts eating the grain. And it may be a little bit shy of something strange, but the grain is there. And they take the first grain, then the next grain. Before long, their heads are bowed. And they're going into the box. And they're not looking around at their circumstances. They're concentrating on that which is appeasing their appetite at the moment. Until they go into the box. And they're trapped. And they're, the hunter grabs the line and yanks it and the stick falls out and they're caught. And no matter how hard they try, they can't get out. Because you see, birds have to have a little bit of distance to fly. And so they can't, they can flap their wings, but they can't, they can't get going because the box is above them, around them, they're trapped. That's what temptation does. You see, when a person starts this, the person deceives himself by saying, I'm in control, I can control this. But they're not in control. If they were in control, they wouldn't even do it. You're not in control because in doing it, you're being controlled. That's how temptation works in our lives to cause disturbance. You see, when we talk about how we are tempted, what causes it? It's our lust factor. That which we inwardly and deeply desire. We may suppress it, but we cannot eradicate it. It is a desire for and a passionate longing for something. Now, lust is appropriate. It's talked about immorality. Lust is drains forth immorality and judgment of immorality. But lust can be something else. You know what lust can be? It can be desire for coveting for somebody else's property. Somebody gets a new car. You say, oh, isn't that nice? But inside you're jealous. Because they got something. Or somebody gets a promotion. Oh, isn't that wonderful? But you're stuck where you're at in your job at this time of your life. And you're smiling on the outside. But inside you're resentful because they got that job and you didn't get a promotion. You see, the enemy works on our mind in so many ways. Sometimes in our spiritual walk with God. Because we want certain things that God says. Either, you know, God says this. He says, yes, wait, or I have something better for you. You see, but we, in our passion, our lust, we say we want the yes. We might be willing to use the wait, but we doubt the part that says I have something better for you. You see, lust can cause doubt and lack of faith in your life. God didn't come through for me like I wanted him to come through for me. Basically, what we're saying is, God's at my beck and call. God is subject to me. Lust says, God is subject to you. But righteousness says, I am subject to the will of God. And lust controls you when you think you're controlling it. You can walk away and say, I'm not going to yield to that. Good. But how do you deal with what goes on in your mind dealing with these issues? You see, it is likened to conception and pregnancy. When sin has conceived, the likeness of this is brought about in the scripture. He uses the story of pregnancy. And, and we got some nurses in this service this morning, and they can correct me afterwards, and I'll make a retraction next week if I need to. But basically what happens is that lust is like conceiving. You know, when, when, when conception takes place, and you have a zygote formed, you find out that, first of all, conception that takes place in order to bring forth that child. It's got to have a starting point. Lust has a starting point. It comes in your mind, in your heart. It's there. You've allowed it space to form in who you are. When the, when the zygote begins to develop into a fetus, it begins to draw life from the mother. The placentia, the blood flowing in gives oxygen. Nutrients come. It's living off what the mother ingests. That's the reason why that you have babies today that are born cocaine or drug babies. Because 
while they're going through pregnancy, they did that. Or they come forth and they have proclivity to the law and emphysema promise because they spoke. Because these things are transmitted. Therefore, when lust is conceived in your life, it's like a pregnant woman. It begins to draw the life from you in order that it might develop. Wow. It develops because it's drawing from you. You begin to come to fruition. But what you're giving, developing in your life is the fetus from hell. It brings about the birth of sin and its consequences. Because it said, for when sin is conceived, it brings forth death. The word thanatos is an interesting word in Greek. And what it means is that it brings forth a death caused by pestilence oftentimes. Not all the time, but many times that word means a pestilent death. It brings forth a pestilent death. You see, the end result is pestilence of life and spiritual death. So when you define temptation, it's, an, it's a test. You are tested. Everybody's going to be tested by temptation. It may be strange. What may not tempt you will tempt somebody else, but vice versa. What doesn't tempt them will tempt you. And then what happens is, is that it brings forth this sense of enticement. You're enticed. You begin to start thinking. What happens is your mind begins to develop scenarios of how this would happen. Oh, if I only could get that car, I'd recapture my youth. Or you begin to look at somebody and they look like the best thing since sliced bread. Or that job. If I could only be, get that position, I would be happy. You begin to think about what all the things it will bring to you. But you don't see what the end result is. Because there is a final result to lust. Final result to lust. I mentioned this before, and I'm going to mention it again by way of stirring up your mind by way of remembrance. Paul did it so I could do it too. My cousin Rosalind, one day there was a knock at the door, pounding at her mother at Aunt Laura's door. And a man says, it says, Ma'am, said, do you have a daughter? He said, she said, yes, said, you better get out here to your daughter in the front yard. So she's in danger. And she looked out, and Rosalind was standing there, a little girl, about four years old. And she was showing on a stick. She was showing the people that went by. And what she was showing was her beautiful necklace. It was black and red, striped and gold. It was beautiful. And it was laying there over the stick. What the little girl Rosalind didn't realize was this necklace that she was soon put around her neck would kill her. What she had was a coral snake. Coral snake is neurotoxic poison. It's in Florida, along the Gulf Coast. And she held it up not knowing that that which looked so pretty was so poisonous. Lust will give to you the beauty of a necklace of death. Therefore, God calls us to resist temptation. The scripture says, resist the devil. He will free from you. How do you do that? You draw close to God and God will draw close to you. And what happens in the failure of life is that we may have regrets for our failures. But let me tell you, if you come to Jesus and you ask him to forgive you, if you turn from those things that are wrong, you're no longer in condemnation. You can start. God can give you hope. You can develop your future from the brokenness of your past. I'm an addict. I can't get free from it. Yes, you can. I'm a person who battles uh, things of the past that I can't seem to get let go of them. Yes, you can. I've been hurt. Yes, you can still be healed. I failed even though I've tried. I, why try again? Because God's got grace. God's got mercy. God will forgive you. Condemnation no more, sin lost all control. I am set free. Jesus, your name brings healing to me. Amen. Amen. Bow your heads. Father, I pray that in these next couple